Yeah, uh, so today we're going to talk about Edge and why it's the best browser and you should use it instead of Chrome. <laughs> uh, no, I'm just kidding, we're talking about the Edge runtime. Um, so I think there's kind of a lot of FOMO in tech, so I'm going to start out with this, like you're all already using Bun in production, right? Um, like this stuff is really cool, it's really exciting, and like I'm already using it and I love it, but like, you, like it's fine if you're not, and maybe even more importantly, I think there's people from boot camps here, like, I would never ask about this in like a junior developer interview, so we're just here to have fun and talk about cool new stuff, basically. Um, so what we're gonna talk about is like how we got here, um, then what the Edge runtime is, why it's great, and yeah, the spoiler's already there, and also why it's not that great yet, and kind of what still needs to happen to make it like more universal. Um, a bit about me, my name's Chris, um, I work for Axiom. We also do observability, but kind of for everybody who Dynatrace doesn't cover. So <laughs> if you have like um, a personal project, we give you 500 gigs of ingest a month for free, and we um, have a one-click integration with Vercel or also SDKs for everything, and then for like small, medium, and even kind of large companies, I think we have some pretty attractive offerings. I also do some open source, Tier PC, Create G3 app, and like my main thing is DX, so like I like to make web dev easy for people. Right, so like if we think about how we um, deploy web applications, like the, the first thing we did was we put Linux on some box, we put a web server on it, maybe Apache, and then we put our code on there. And like this works really well. And maybe let's also include the like, new version of this, which is Docker containers. It's still kind of the same thing. Um, but you kind of start running into issues with this. You know, the first one is that running servers is really hard. Like this is a list of um, vulnerabilities in the Linux kernel currently, and like that's not the only part of your stack. And if you've ever worked at a company that runs their own servers, like you probably had something that was brutally out of date, like Ubuntu from four years ago or Node 12 or something. Like everybody knows this, you're never up to date. And you can hire like a DevOps person, but they cost a hundred thousand a year or more. And like, you just want to think about your product, not your servers, especially like if you're a smaller company. The other thing is scaling is really hard. Like, when you're ten percent usage, like you're wasting ninety percent of your compute. And when you're at ninety percent usage, you're like, oh god, I hope I don't get more users, which is also not really where you want to be. And like, you know, there's Kubernetes and auto scaling and all this stuff. But again, like, it's really really hard. So AWS came in, like AWS Lambda came in and it really changed the game. Um, like the premise is that in these diagrams, like if the arrows are time, like for the traditional server, right, it's just running, and the request comes in, the server gives a response, and the server keeps running. With Lambda, like your code is shared, like the server runs a bunch of different people's codes, and when a request comes in, it loads in like your API endpoint, handles the request, and then wipes it all out again. And what's really cool about this is like you can scale to zero, and you can scale to infinity, or at least like to how many servers Amazon has, or probably how much money you have. And you don't need to worry about like running servers, and you can just focus on building your product, basically. But Lambda also like isn't perfect, right? Like first off, it's generalist, which also means like it's super complex. Um, like it's basically just a Docker container. Um, and it can get really big. So like on AWS, you can use up to six CPUs, 10 gigs of RAM. Um, on Vercel, Lambda's default to one gig of RAM, which is still a lot. Um, it's designed to live in one region, like almost everything in AWS. So like you get a lot of network latency. And yeah, there's just a lot of high overhead. Um, and the other thing is like it gets quite expensive. So for example, if you use it, like the AWS numbers are a bit more difficult. The Vercel numbers are easier, so I'll use those. The cell charge is 40 bucks per 100 gigabyte hours. So if you think that one request takes maybe 100 milliseconds to handle, then you're looking at $11 for every million um, hits that you get, basically. And that 100 milliseconds is honestly kind of a low guess because with Lambda, like, if you start paying, not, like, not when your server starts doing stuff, but like, as it starts loading your code in. So if you have like, a three second cold start, you're paying for three seconds. And if you spend like 200 milliseconds to ping your database or some other API, you're paying for that time also. Like the clock is just on the whole time. And it also like always just felt kind of bad, like especially for us JavaScript developers, Node is really good at like using one thread to handle a bunch of requests. And with Lambda, like you're spinning up a whole thing every time you make a request. And yeah, it just never felt great. 
The other thing is sending data around the world takes a lot of time. So, um, for example, from here to the East Coast, you're looking at like 120 milliseconds. And this is never like going to get that much faster because we're running into the speed of light. Like the cables under the ocean are running at like two thirds the speed of light. So we're kind of hitting like the wall on how much this can be optimized. And like 120 milliseconds is pretty good, but for people in South America or in Australia, like their internet is terrible a lot of the times because a lot of sites still only exist in one region. So like since a long time, like we've been starting to solve this, um, like we started caching static stuff. So Akamai was kind of like the first really big company to handle this. And like nowadays, like all the static assets, so um, like your HTML, your JavaScript, like if you have a React app, probably like your whole front end bundle is being cached. So that comes from like a server that's really close to the user. Um, but but with um, APIs, it's a bit more difficult. Like there, we can cache also. But like, can anybody in the audience raise their hand if more than half of API requests are handled by a cache? Wow, <laughs> two, three hands went up. Come talk to me after. <laughs> um, like, or even with GraphQL, you can cache it. Like, Stellate is awesome. But the point is, like, you're always going to have stuff that like you can't resolve with a cache. So the question becomes like. We have these servers that are super close to the user. Could we run arbitrary code on them? And like the, the kind of obvious answer is yes, we can. They're computers, we can run code on them. But with something like Lambda, it's really difficult because like Lambdas are huge, right? And imagine like shipping that Lambda to 300 different data centers every time. Like how much that would cost? Like what we're trying to optimize here is money and time, right? And the other thing is like with Lambda, imagine the cold starts if your code lived in 300 different regions and each of the regions like has its own cold starts. So we need a completely different thing if like we wanna run our compute everywhere. The thing that people came up with is called V8 isolates. So V8 is the JavaScript and WebAssembly engine in Chrome. And the way to think of an isolate is basically a browser tab. So if you have a Lambda or a Docker container, like you bring in your own runtime and everything, but with V8 isolates, like all the processes or all the requests like share one JavaScript runtime. So you have way more space for the user code. And like the way to think about this is basically a web browser. So like if you're using Chrome, you have a hundred tabs open, you don't have a hundred JavaScript runtimes running, right? Because that would be completely insane. But like this is how we're currently handling a lot of our APIs. The next question is kind of um, if you have like, okay, we can basically use a browser to handle this stuff, but a browser is not a web server, right? Um, well, we have the service worker API that's been around for quite a long time. And basically what this was originally for is if you wanted to have an application that works well if the user is offline. So it would sit between HTTP requests and the internet basically and like intercept them. And if you're offline, like maybe handle the request from a cache or something. If you're online, like just send it to whatever API you wanted to send it to. Data comes back, you do like whatever your API stuff is, and you give it back to the user. That's what a web server does, right? Like that's what an API does. And the last big problem was kind of Node doesn't run in the browser. And the problem here is that first off, like Node is really big. Like it's awesome, like it was awesome when it first came out and it's still awesome, um, but it wouldn't work for this kind of thing because we want like this model to be really small so that we can put it in 300 places. The solution here is WinterCG, which um, it's basically like a, a community group in the W3C, which is the standards body. And what they're doing is like making everybody agree on like standards of how certain bits of JavaScript should work. So like readable streams, web crypto, fetch. Like if you've ever had to like um, use like fetch a node until recently, you know how hard this stuff is and like how non-standard it is. And there's this meme, right, where like there's 13 standards and you introduce it, like one to solve it all, now there's 14 standards. But this time it feels like it might actually work, because like if you look at the list of who's supporting this, it's like Cloudflare, Vercel, Fastly, Netlify, um, Deno, like everyone's behind this. And yeah, like basically what they're doing is creating a minimum common API that you can write code for and then it'll run everywhere. And then each runtime can also like optionally bring its own like standard library or other stuff. And it just means that it's gonna be much more universal than before.
Um, the example I'm going to use for all of this is Cloudflare Workers because I think that's the one that's most relevant to React developers. The other big one is um, Deno Deploy. And I have Cloudflare Workers, Vercel uses them also. So if you put your Next.js app on Vercel and you run stuff on the Edge runtime, that's actually using Cloudflare Workers that Vercel, I guess, buys from Cloudflare and resells. Um, Cloudflare Workers, um, they are all the stuff I just talked about. So Winter CG compliant, they run in V8 isolates. The original design was kind of only for edge middleware, so like, if you're making a request, and, or if the user makes a request, and if they have a cookie, you want to send them to your app, and if they don't, you want to send them to your marketing page, maybe. Like that sort of stuff, it was very clear even a long time ago that if the user needs to eat like a three second cold start before you know where to redirect them, like that feels terrible. So yeah, that's what edge middleware was kind of for in the beginning, but it's becoming more universal. And yeah, it's quite small, so it maxes out at 128 megs of RAM. And usually you're using quite a bit less than that, and one megabyte of user code, which if you compare that to like a traditional Node app, it's tiny. And that, like, it can feel quite limiting at first, but actually, like, the constraints actually make you build better APIs and make you use better libraries. The other thing is it's super cheap. So if you remember, earlier I said on Vercel, you're paying, let's say, like 11 bucks for a million requests if you use Lambda. Um, when you use workers, you're paying two bucks, so that's a fifth. And then if you use Cloudflare directly, it's even a quarter of that price. You might still want to use Vercel, I'll get into that later. Um, and the other thing is, it's really secure. Like, V8 is one of the most tested pieces of software in the world. Like, people kind of get scared when you say, oh, all the different applications code, like, shares the same runtime. But you type your credit card number into the browser all the time, right? And you're not worried about, like, another tab stealing your credit card information. Because like this is a problem that basically like people have been working on for a very long time and yeah I don't know like make your own judgment but it's they I would say it's as secure as Lambda and like let's talk about speed this is where it gets really amazing I hope this text is big enough um, I have Lambda on the left and the Cloud for Work on the right and obviously like the the minimum for the Cloud for Worker is amazing it's seven milliseconds. But that's not even that big a deal, because like 30 milliseconds on the Lambda, um, that's also pretty fast. By the way, this is like the ideal possible test for Lambda, because um, I put the Lambda in Frankfurt, which most Lambdas are not going to be in Frankfurt, they're going to be on the east coast of America. Um, and I'm sending like one request after the other, so you're not really hitting cold starts, where usually with Lambda, like you're going to hit some amount of cold starts. <laughs> Where I think it's really awesome is like for kind of the long tail of slow requests. So if you look at Lambda, um, here the P99, so one in 100 requests is slower than that. That's 800 something milliseconds. Edge workers in 100,000 requests didn't take 800 milliseconds ever. The very slowest one was 500 milliseconds. And the P99 was 20 milliseconds. So it just gives you like a completely different level of performance. Maybe another way to look at it, like this is marketing material from Cloudflare, but I think like it's basically true. Um, like this, the worst edge worker request is like, it's like here, it's like a decent to slightly bad Lambda request. And the bulk of them are like way further down. Um, now, of course, you don't always wanna have your edge worker be in Frankfurt, because like what if you need to talk to the database, right? Like that would be really bad because like if you talk to a database, usually you're making maybe three round trips to the database. So the first one like to get a connection, then the second one to authenticate a user, and the third one to do like the actual stuff that your API is doing. So if you need to go from um, Vienna to New York and back three times, that's gonna be super slow because again, like we're running into the speed of light. And so this is where the like the premise of regional edge comes in, which is the one on the left here. Like, what if you just put the edge function in one place? Like, you lose this um, like thing of having 10 millisecond response times, but you still have like way smaller code, it still runs way faster, it's still way cheaper. So like you're keeping everything except the advantage of the regionality. Um, yeah, so like it's still good at pretty much almost everything. The other thing that's really nice is like a year or two ago, this stuff was still really hard to use. But then in next, I think 12.2 point something, like they introduced edge middleware and now they, like now with I think 13 point something, they introduced edge for everything. So now the way you 
um, send the API handler to the edge if you're deploying to Vercel, is you just write that the runtime should be edge, and then optionally you can say which region you want it to be in. Or you can also give an array of regions, for example, if you have like read replicas of your database, maybe you want to pick three regions. Um, here I also said force dynamic, which means we never hit a cache, you know, maybe you want to hit a cache sometimes. But yeah, that's all it is, and you deploy to Vercel and your app is on the edge. And what really kind of amazes me about this, like sorry to have this talk as an ad for Vercel, um, <coughs> but like you just connect a GitHub repo and you're deploying your static content to a CDN. You're deploying anything that needs to be a Lambda to Lambdas. You're deploying anything that should be, like can be on edge, but needs to be close to your database to regional edge, and you're deploying anything that can be global edge to global edge. And all you have to do is like add these two lines to your API handler files. What that means to me is that like front-end JavaScript developers can really like have a lot of power in the backend and even kind of an infrastructure. And it lets you just build stuff ridiculously fast. But of course, I said in the beginning, like not everything's great yet. So the biggest limitation probably is that it's only JavaScript and Wasm. And it's not even all Wasm. So for example, like Golang Wasm isn't really gonna work because you still need to bring your own runtime. And we're limited to one megabyte here, so like it gets hard. And like Rust Wasm kind of works, um, but at Axiom we've been playing it and it's still very clunky to say the least. Um, like we're writing the tests for it in TypeScript and I don't know, it's just not a very good situation. Yet. Realistically, if you want to ship to Edge, you're writing TypeScript. Um, library support is still um, mixed, I would say, but it's getting better basically because people are so enthusiastic about this stuff, like new libraries are coming up that work better with Edge. So for example, um, like Prisma, the ORM that a lot of people like, it's never gonna run on Edge because it uses native bindings to Rust to like do the database stuff. But there's newer libraries now called, for example, Drizzle, which is like a really great way to hit your um, library from the edge. And then um, like the serverless databases are also catching up. So for example, PlanetScale now has a web driver that works over HTTP requests instead of like actual database stuff. So it's super fast, super easy. And like if you want to use, for example, um, Postgres, there's also Neon, which Vercel uses for their database product. If you want to use SQLite, there's Torso which I haven't tried yet, but I heard it's um, awesome. The other thing is you still kind of have some of the same issues as Lambda, right? Like for a lot of things, this cannot be your entire backend because it's ephemeral. So like request comes in, you handle it, and all your stuff is gone. So that doesn't really work for anything that's like a long running service or a cron or um, like web sockets. But also for this, like more and more there's solutions, like especially in the Cloudflare ecosystem, um, for example, they have durable objects now, which is a really awesome way of doing basically WebSockets. Um, they're providing KV now. They have um, like an easy way to do cron. You still like need either like a small long running server somewhere or like external services, but it's getting to the point where you can really do a lot with um, using the edge. The other thing I've already mentioned this a bit, like. Outside of Vercel, the DX is still kind of bad. Um, I'll get to Cloudflare and Deno in a minute. And it's still fairly new, so like docs and education are mostly quite bad. Um, yeah, Cloudflare and Deno deploy. The biggest problem is first off, this whole regional edge thing I just talked about, it only works on Vercel. Um, Cloudflare and Deno deploy for some, re uh, for some reason still don't let you select regions. So if you deploy, um, for example, a Next.js app to Cloudflare that uses um, Edge for its entire API, all of your functions are sitting in every region, which means like you have that problem again where you have like a million really slow round trips to your database. The other thing is um, both Cloudflare, well, actually just Cloudflare now, um, doesn't have no compa compatibility at all. So um, like they don't have Lambda, so you can't deploy Lambdas and they have no other way to run Node which means that if you have an application that still needs some routes that use a node or that need to be on a Lambda for some reason, you just can't do it with them. Um, Deno Deploy just announced, I think a couple days ago, that they're adding compatibility to all of Node and all of NPM. I don't know yet how in the world that's gonna work, but I'm really excited to find out like what they've come up with. And with Vercel, um, they have awesome features and they have awesome DX, but like I said before, it's four times the price of Cloudflare, which like the DX might be worth it, but it's, it's still like a hard pill to swallow. 
and they're only in 20 of Cloudflare's regions instead of like the, all the 300 that Cloudflare has. So for example, for us here, the nearest Cloudflare data center, center is in Vienna, so it's really close. The nearest, like, the nearest Cloudflare data center that Vercel uses is in Frankfurt, which is like 800 kilometers away or something. So that brings you back from like 12 milliseconds or 10 milliseconds up to like 30 to 40 for like the fastest possible response you can get. Um, and the other thing is Vercel for some reason, and I haven't fully figured this out yet, they still kind of have cold starts. So Lambda's like, uh, sorry, edge workers don't have cold starts because um, like they work differently. But with Vercel, what I've seen and what other people have seen when they're benchmarking it is that for some reason, for like about 20% of the requests, you get significantly slower responses. So instead of like 30 milliseconds to Frankfurt, some percentage of the time you're looking at like 100, 100 milliseconds. But the thing with all of that is like, it's still really good and it's still faster and cheaper than Lambda. So like, I think even with all the issues of Vercel, like it still remains really compelling. And like the stuff is still so new that it's gonna get, like it's been getting way better really fast and yeah, it's gonna keep getting better really fast, I think, just because if you can cut costs by like 80% and make stuff way faster, like that's like the dream of every company that runs a web application. So a lot of work is going into this stuff. The last thing I'll kind of talk about is architecture. So the way I would build an MVP today is I just use Next.js with edge functions for the front end and back end and then planets go for the database and just pay for external services for like, um, you know, message queues and cron and like all the other stuff you might need. This gets you going so fast, it's incredible. But of course, maybe like you have an existing app and you know, you can't do this whole thing, replace it with something else. So like here's kind of an example um, of what Axie was doing for some stuff currently. So if the user visits your app, um, like first we have a global edge middleware that like I said earlier checks the cookie and then they get sent to either the landing page or the app. And then the app itself is, I mean the landing page as well are served from the CDN, so that's also like um, 10 millisecond response time or something. And then the app also has um, a lot of its API routes or a couple and it's getting more and more on the edge now, especially for like in between stuff. So rate limiting, hiding API keys, um, like routing things. All of this sort of stuff is really easy to put on the edge because you don't have a lot of dependencies. And then in a lot of cases, like you might still have like your main backend, which for example, maybe it's Golang on Lambdas, right? And that's kind of the candidate for like slowly moving to regional edge and like getting those incredible um, performance and price savings. And yeah, I think my big prediction is this is gonna be the default way to deploy stuff in a few years. The same way that Lambda became the default way to deploy stuff a couple of years ago, like this is just so compelling. Like once there's kind of feature and VX parity, no one's gonna say let's deploy it to the one that's slow and expensive, right? They're gonna go, they're gonna want to go to the one that's fast and cheap. And like I said before, I think this is super exciting because it puts us JavaScript developers in this awesome position where suddenly our language is like the best language for writing a fast API in. And yeah, like a couple of years ago, a lot of companies placed big bets on Lambdas and it really paid off for them. And I think the same thing is gonna happen here again, that if you get in early, it's really gonna pay off. Um, yes, yeah, so that's all I have, open for questions.